Welcome to our video on the basics of heredity, part 1, Mendelian genetics. My dad isn't feeling well, so I'm going to help him with this video. I hope you like it. In the mid-1850s, an Austrian monk named Gregor Mendel made a series of observations and inferences recording the basis, regarding the basis of inheritance of physical traits. With a background in mathematics and a penchant for gardening, Mendel meticulously studied over 30,000 individual pea plants over a seven-year period. Really, what else is there to do as a 19th century monk? These observations became the basis for how we understand modern genetics and accurately predicted the presence and mechanism of transfer of genes long before the nature of DNA had been determined. Before we look at Mendel, Mendel's work, let's consider what was known at the time. It was known that offspring tend to look like their parents and that siblings look alike. It was also known that... Hey, wait a minute! Declan! Daddy! Declan put a picture of himself in your video! No, I didn't! Sorry about that. It was known that selective breeding could shape livestock and agricultural products. Sexual reproduction was understood and that there must be a combining of gametes to ensure the next generation but the underlying mechanism was not known. Remember, while you may understand meiosis as part of the process to produce gametes and DNA as a physical carrier of the genetic code, people of Mendel's time did not have direct knowledge of the cellular and chemical processes involved. This is what makes Mendel's work so impressive. Mendel was studying pea plants that produce flowers with both male and female reproductive structures, so self-fertilization is possible. Mendel was able to cross-pollinate specific plants and observe the traits of the resulting plants and compare them to the traits of the parent. What Mendel observed was that he had a field where pea plants grew tall and another plot where peas grew short. If he bred one of these tall plants with another tall plant, he only produced tall plants. If he bred the short plants with the other short plants, then he only produced short plants. He had what he called pure breeding lines. What happens when we make a hybrid? when we cross one of the peer breeding tall plants with one of these peer breeding short plants. We call these plants the P1 generation or parent generation. What would be the most logical hypothesis for the results? Many of you already know how this goes, but it is not unreasonable to predict that these hybrid plants would be medium in height. In fact, that is the most logical conclusion. However, every time Mendel made this cross between a tall plant from the tall only field and a peer breeding tall plant from and the short plant from the short field, all the results were, were tall, 100% of the time, no exceptions. We call these plants the F1 generation. It's, it was as if the shortness version of this trait was gone. But here's the interesting thing. What happens if he takes these tall offspring plants, two of these F1 plants, and cross them with each other? Now remember, both of these plants are tall, and previously when we crossed tall with tall, we only produced tall plants, and when we crossed our tall with short, we only produced tall plants. So now again, crossing two tall plants, we would logically hypothesize that we should see only tall offspring. However, this is not what happened. In fact, from this cross of the two hybrid plant, tall plants, we produced both tall and short plants. The shortness factor hadn't gone away, it had just been hidden. The most important part of this observation by Mendel was that the ratio of tall to short plants in this F2 generation was consistently 3 to 1. Three-fourths of the plants were tall and one-fourth were short. Every time, to a mathematician like Mendel, this was no accident. This was not due to chance. These results led Mendel to make a few inferences. 1. Traits or characteristics are being controlled by distinct factors. We call them genes. 2. For each trait, a person carries two of these factors, one inherited from each parent. 3. These factors come in alternate forms that we will call alleles. 4. When opposing alleles are inherited together, only one is expressed, the dominant allele. The other allele is said to be recessive. 5. When an individual carries two factors of each trait, they can only pass along one to their offspring. We call this the law of segregation. Traits are characteristic, in this case height, was not being controlled by one factor, but instead two. If it was controlled by only one, then how could shortness return? 
so an individual receives two factors for each trait, one from each parent. Those factors come in two forms, one that dominates the other. In other words, one factor will be expressed over the other when both are present at the same time. We call this the law of dominance. Let's define a few useful terms. Genes are distinct hereditary units, specific portions of DNA, that determine characteristics of the organism. Alternate forms of each gene are called alleles. Each trait is determined by two alleles, one from each parent. Often one allele is dominant over the other. Using this information, let's revisit these crosses and look at them in a different way. We will use letters to represent the different alleles of our trait, so our trait is height. One rule we need to follow is to use one letter for each trait. Convention holds that we usually pick the first letter of the dominant trait, so in our example we will use T to represent height. But this height gene comes in two different forms, tall and short. Again, it is convention that we assign the dominant allele, the capital version of this letter, and the recessive version of the allele receives the lowercase letter T. So our original parent plants can re be represented by the two letter combinations big T big T and little t little t. This two letter combination that represents the alleles present is called a genotype. These two genotypes can be described as big T big T homozygous dominant and little t little t homozygous recessive. The genetic expression, in other words, that we see when we look at the parents is called the phenotype, and here we have tall and short. Now we can show the cross using what we call a Punnett square. We are going to put this parent's gametes along this side, and this parent's gametes along the top. Now we recombine them to see what our, that our offspring are all big T, little t. and 100% of F1 will have the big T, little t genotype and the tall phenotype. We can describe this genotype as heterozygous. Based on the law of dominance, we know that these plants with this genotype will have the tall phenotype. On to our second generation cross. When we cross these two hybrids, Let's see what we get. Using our Punnett square, we show how each parent can give half of its genetic material. These T's here, and these T's here. When we recombine the gametes, we should get these results for our F2 generation. This is a monohybrid cross. We need to give the results as genotypic results and phenotypic results. One of our four boxes is homozygous dominant. Two of our boxes are heterozygous. And one of our four boxes is homozygous recessive. For our phenotypic results, we have three tall and one short. Looking at it this way, we can clearly see why Mendel always produced a 3 to 1 phenotypic ratio with this series of crosses. So far, we have only considered one trait, but what if we look at two traits at the same time, like height and color? In peas, green pods are dominant to yellow pods, so our key looks like this. Let's so show a cross between a pea plant that is homozygous dominant for both height and color, and a pea plant that is short and yellow. Stop the video and write genotypes for each parent plant. Remember, we are describing two traits, so our genotype must have four letters in it. Let's see if you came up with the correct genotypes for these parent plants. A plant that is homozygous dominant for the height will have two big T's, and homozygous for color, two big G's. And if a pea plant is short, it must have two little T's, and yellow, two little G's. So here are our parents. Due to the law of segregation, each parent can only give one half of its information. But which half? This half? How about this half? The law of segregation said that we have to give one of each type of factor. 
So each parent can only give one T and one G. So here's what we get. Now let's put them back together. When we recombine the gametes, we see that each of these boxes is going to be the same, so we don't need them. Now what will we get? Wait, we don't need to want to do this. Declan, I think my little brother is messing with Daddy's work again. We don't want to write it this way. When we fill our boxes, we want to put the T's back next to each other and the G's back next to each other. It makes it much easier to read. Now we can see the results. The genotypic results are 100% heterozygous for both traits. We can call that dihybrid. And the phenotypic results are 100% tall green plants. Now let's perform a dihybrid cross and see what happens. We take two of the F1 hybrids and cross them. We start by segregating our T's and then our G's based on the principle of segregation. Then we reach a very interesting point. Just because I give the dominant height gene, do I have to give the dominant color gene? Or could I switch them? The principle of independent assortment says that the segregation of one gene pair is independent event from the segregation of another gene pair as long as they are on separate chromosomes. In other words, as long as they are not linked. So do the dominant green pods go with the dominant tall gene? Or, and does the recessive yellow gene go with the recessive height gene? It turns out they are not tied together. Mendel performed thousands of crosses looking at the two traits at the same time and it led him to describe the, this principle of independent assortment. Which means, what this means is that we can make each of these four possible gametes. Now we are ready to set up our Punnett square. The principle of segregation says that we have to segregate our, segregate our T's and our G's. And the principle of independent assortment shows that we can also make these two combinations. We get the same gametes along the top. Now we recombine to see what our possible offspring are. Stop the video here and fill out your own Punnett square. Okay, now let's see how you did. The next step is to record our results. First, the genotypic results. We have to write down each possible genotype. As we look through the Punnett square, we see that there are nine different possible outcomes. Now we have to count how many times each shows up. I'm going to mark them off as I find them. We have one of these, and two of these, and one of these, and two of these, and four of these, and two of these, and one of these, and two of these, and finally one of these. So our genotypic ratio is 1 to 2 to 1 to 2 to 4 to 2 to 1 to 2 to 1. Now let's look at the phenotypic results. First, we need to write down all the possible phenotypes. We can have tall and green, and tall and yellow, short and green, and short and yellow. Again, I count and mark off what I find in each box. Tall and green, 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 nine. Tall and yellow, tall and yellow, tall and yellow, three. Short and green, short and green, short and green, three. And finally, short and yellow, one. We see that for a dihybrid cross, we get a phenotypic ratio of 9 to 3 to 3 to 1. So that's going to do it for the basics of Mendelian genetics. My dad will make some more videos where he will talk about some variations of Mendel's themes and specifics on human chromosomes and human genetics. 
I hope you learned something, and if you have any questions, ask my dad in the comments section below the video. Um, please excuse me while I go beat up my brother.